Hello everyone, and welcome to my talk entitled Multiple Defects in Persistent Phosphors. I suggest we dive right in and start by describing what a persistent luminescent material looks like. Persistent luminescent materials, much like normal luminescent materials, are usually composed of an inorganic host. In this case, we picked strontium aluminate, and into this host we will incorporate a few impurity ions. And the first type of impurity ions are the activators, which lend the materials their luminescent properties. We chose to use europium 2 plus as an activator, and this results in nice green emission. Additionally, we also added this prosium 3 plus, which acts as a trapping defect and which in fact is responsible for the persistent luminescence itself, by which I mean for the luminescence that lasts longer than the excitation itself. In fact, the material described here is one of the best known glow-in-the-dark phosphors, which we all already encountered in, for example, the safety signage on planes or glow-in-the-dark watch dials. The mechanism behind persistent luminescence is fairly simple and can be explained by making use of this very simplified energy level diagram. If we switch on the excitation source, which is a blue LED, then the activator will absorb the excitation light. And this will quickly be followed by a charge transfer from the activator to the metastable trap. If enough energy is provided to this trap charge, the energy barrier can be overcome and the charge can be transferred back to the activator, finally resulting in the emission of a photon. Now, if we were to switch off the excitation light, the phosphor would keep on emitting light, because in this case the decay time is no longer the intrinsic decay time of the excited state of the activator, but is determined by the trapping defect itself and by the energy barrier. Here you can see an example of the time dependency of the afterglow intensity. The excitation source was switched off at t equals zero, but the material keeps on emitting light and the intensity decreases over time, yet it remains visible for a few hours after the excitation has stopped. Naturally, these measurements take very long time, which is why people often turn to thermoluminescence to investigate these materials. And by heating the sample at a constant heating rate, we can obtain a glow curve. The traps are emptied faster, the intensity rises over a short temperature range, and then we record this curve here. It is clear that there is a very large contribution at relatively low temperature. And these are the traps, which we call shallow traps, and which are responsible for the afterglow of the material. They will also be the topic of the first part of my presentation. Because these shallow traps are not only responsible for the afterglow of the phosphor, but also affect other optical properties of these luminescent materials. And one of these properties is internal quantum efficiency, which is defined as a number of emitted photons divided by the number of absorbed photons. In this graph, you can see the intensity dependency of this quantum efficiency. And as you can see, in contrast to what you might expect, this quantum efficiency is not constant, but decreases with increasing excitation intensity, going from around 70% at low intensities to about 50% at high excitation intensities. As I said, this is actually quite unexpected, and to see how we can explain this, we need to take another look at the simple energy level diagram I showed you before. So this is what we had before, but if we now take into account the excited states of the filled traps, we might also take into account that part of the excitation light is absorbed by the filled trap, and that this opens up an additional optical detrapping route from the excited state of the filled trap back to the activator, eventually leading to emission. This process is called optically stimulated luminescence by excitation light, and it's actually a loss mechanism. Let's have a closer look. When we switch on the excitation source, one photon is absorbed by the activator, which quickly transfers a charge to the trap. This filled trap can now absorb a second blue photon, and from this excited state, the electron can be transferred back to the activator, eventually leading to the emission of a photon. Now, this is a two photon in one photon out process, which has an intrinsic maximum a quantum efficiency of about 50%. So clearly, this is a loss mechanism, which could potentially indeed induce this decrease in quantum efficiency that we have seen. But how do we explain this intensity dependency? Well, at low intensities, the thermal detrapping route is preferred over the optical detrapping route. One photon is absorbed and one photon is emitted, 
And in the ideal case, we would have a quantum efficiency of 100%. At higher intensities, the optical detrapping route becomes more probable than the thermal detrapping route. And I explained before, two photons in, one photon out. So this process has a maximum uh, internal quantum efficiency of 50%. So you can see that we are going from a high quantum efficiency at low intensity to a lower quantum efficiency at higher intensity, which is in line with the results I have shown you before. Now, if optically stimulated luminescence by excitation light is really responsible for this decrease in quantum efficiency, then we might expect the absorption of the phosphor to be intensity dependent as well. Because as you can see, there are two contributions to this absorption, one by the activator and one by the traps. And the trap occupation is actually intensity dependent itself, increasing with increasing excitation intensity. So, because this is intensity dependent, we might expect the absorption to be intensity dependent as well. And this is indeed the case, and the absorption of the phosphor increases with increasing excitation intensity. And we could try to model this based on a very simple model for the absorption. Because in essence, we only have four relevant impurity centers. We have the two we started with, the European 2 plus and the empty trap and the two that were created after exposure to blue light, namely the European 3 plus and the fill trap. But we can further simplify this because we know that European 3 plus has a negligible absorption at these wavelengths, and we additionally assume that the empty trap also uh, barely contributes to the absorption. So in fact, we only have two species to take into account, the European 2 plus and the fill trap. And therefore we can write down the following equation for the average absorption of the phosphor, where the first term represents the absorption due to the activator, due to europium 2 plus, and the second term represents the absorption due to the fill traps. In fact, the intensity dependency of the absorption is introduced through the intensity dependency of F, which is the fraction of ionized europium centers or the fraction of filled traps. And this F can actually very easily be determined by varying the excitation intensity of the phosphor, waiting until steady state conditions are reached, stopping the excitation, and then just integrating the afterglow that comes out of the phosphor. The results of such an experiment are shown at the left-hand side, where you can see that this fraction of ionized activators increases with increasing excitation intensity and levels off around 1.6%. You can already see that there is uh, quite a similarity between the intensity dependency of F and the intensity dependency of the absorption. So if we now try to plug in um, the results for F using our simple model into the absorption, and we could try to fit this, and then we can see that the uh, agreement is actually uh, fairly good, especially considering the simplicity of this model and some of the assumptions we have uh, made. The results we get out of this are as follows, and the exact numbers are not really that interesting, but what is interesting is that the absorption cross-section of the fill traps is actually much higher than the absorption cross-section of the European 2 plus. This means that it's much more probable to have optical detrapping than it is to have optical trapping, and that in fact optically stimulated luminescence by excitation light represents an actively limiting uh, mechanism, limiting the storage capacity of our phosphor. So, so the more we try to fill the traps, the more we are actually also emptying traps, and there is nothing to gain by increasing the excitation intensity. If we want to improve on the storage capacity of these persistent phosphors, a task into which many researchers have invested a lot of time over the past two decades, it appears we need to limit the optical absorption by the fill traps. Now, this concludes the part about the shallow traps, and as some of you might have guessed by now, the second and final part of my presentation will, about, of course, be about deep traps in the material. We will start by having a second look at the thermoluminescence glow curve I showed you at the beginning of my presentation. It appears that there is only a contribution at lower temperatures, which we previously attributed to the shallow trapping defects. Therefore, it seems also that there is not much left to talk about for me in the final part of my presentation. However, we should keep in mind that the L curves should be corrected for thermal quenching, 
which in the case of strontium aluminate sets in around 165 degrees. Performing this correction reveals a second broad thermoluminescence peak which is located at considerably higher temperatures and which can hence be expected to be stable at room temperature. Consequently, it can also be expected that these deeper traps do not directly contribute to the afterglow of the material. However, these deeper traps have hardly been discussed in literature, so we are not completely sure. And if we take a look in literature, there is plenty of examples where shallow trapping defects and um, deeper trapping defects actually interact with each other or where reshuffling of a track occupation occurs upon application of optical or mechanical stimuli. One such an example has been reported by a colleague of mine in barium silicon oxynitride doped with europium, where a redistribution of the occupation from shallow traps to deeper traps occurs after the application of a mechanical stimulus, so after scratching the material. So it would be interesting to investigate this as well in strontium aluminate in a material we have been discussing up till now. And to do this, we devised the following uh, thermoluminescence experiment. So in each experiment, we started by illuminating the material and then uh, heat up to about 250 degrees centigrade, which if you look at the thermoluminescence curve is sufficient to empty all the shallow traps and record the low temperature thermoluminescence peak. Subsequently, we cooled down, illuminated again, heated up to 250 degrees centigrade and repeated the cycle a few times. And finally, at the end, we uh, heated up up to 500 degrees centigrade in order to be able to record the high temperature thermoluminescence peak as well. Let's go through the results of these experiments. So we started for uh, one illumination and preheat cycle and we get the following results. So after illuminating, we heat to 250 degrees centigrade and we get this very little uh, bump of a glow curve. Then we cool down again and finally we heat to 500 degrees centigrade to record the high temperature thermoluminescence glow curve. This was for n equals uh, 1. If we increase this to 2 illumination and preheat cycles, then for the first preheat cycle we get exactly the same result as before, which is a good thing, our results are reproducible. But I would like to stress that at this point, the shallow traps are completely empty. We cool down again and we illuminate once more and then we preheat again to 250 degrees centigrade. And what we see is this. And this is actually quite unexpected because as I pointed out, the shallow traps were empty. So we would have expected after illumination to end up with a similar uh, thermoluminescence intensity as during the first experiment. It seems, however, if we look at this, that the intensity has tremendously increased and that there is some sort of memory effect present in the material. The material remembers that it has already been illuminated once and hence the thermoluminescence output is higher. We can then once again heat up to 500 degrees and then we get the following uh, thermoluminescence curve. And if we do this up to seven times, then we get this result. And I will start by discussing the high temperature globe curves, which are actually quite fine because we did not empty the deep traps in between illumination cycles. So we're just accumulating intensity there and it's, normally, uh, it's normal that the intensity increases. However, as I pointed out before, the shallow trapping defects have been emptied um, in between every illumination. Uh, so we actually would expect the intensity to remain constant, but we see an increase there as well, which is actually quite strange. And which might hint indeed at an interaction between the shallow and the deeper trapping defects, which might be responsible for the memory effect of the material. So the next question we asked ourselves is, what if we raise the preheat temperature? Because now we illuminated and preheated up till 250 degrees and we saw this increase in intensity. But if we raise the temperature to 500 degrees instead of 250 degrees, then the intensity of the thermoluminescence curve remains 
the same. There is no buildup of charges. So it appears indeed that the uh, strange behavior of the low temperature thermoluminescence peak is somehow related to the trap occupation of the deeper traps. And then there are a few options, and the first option is that there is an optical redistribution of the trap occupation. So that while we are illuminating our sample with blue light, we are actually also performing OSL-like experiments, so optically stimulated luminescence-like experiments, where we are transferring or optically inducing a transfer from the deeper traps to the shallow trap, which, given what I have told you in my uh, or during the first part of my presentation uh, is actually quite plausible because these trapping defects do indeed absorb um, part of the excitation light. However, we check this um, by v slightly varying the excitation light wavelength to make sure that we're not exciting European 2 plus but still have a high enough energy to induce a transfer from the deep traps to the shallow traps. But this effect is actually very small, so it seems unlikely that it is responsible for the huge difference in thermoluminescence intensities we have um, seen during the experiment I just explained you. So the second option is actually uh, the option of competitive trap filling, and that when we switch on the excitation source, there is competition between the deep and the shallow traps to um, be filled and that there is actually preferential filling of the deep traps at the expense of the filling of the shallow traps. And indeed we can see this because if we um, measure this uh, trap occupation of shallow and deep traps as a function of the excitation intensity, then you can indeed see that while the deep traps in red are being filled, there is a sublinear filling of the shallow traps, so of the blue curve, during, for example, the first five seconds of excitation. So there is actually a filling, a preferential filling of the deep traps when we switch on the excitation. Um, and only after these deep traps are filled are we also filling the shallow traps at a higher rate. This brings me to my conclusions. So here we have this graph of the thermoluminescence uh, curves once more, and we had shallow trapping defects, which are characterized by a high absorption for excitation wavelengths, which induces OSL by excitation light, and which in turn actively limits the storage capacity of these phosphors. So if we want to improve on their performance, we should probably try to reduce this optical absorption. And then at the other side, we have the deep trapping defects, which are characterized by a high trapping cross-section. So it's actually, they are being filled preferentially. And this alters the filling rate of the shallow trapping defects, which uh, are responsible for the afterglow. So indirectly, um, these deep traps, which are thermally inaccessible at room temperature, are still influencing both the afterglow and the thermoluminescence characteristics of the shallow trapping defects. And with this, I would like to thank you for listening to me uh, during my presentation, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.